I've got a uh, research research review segment on ATP supplementation. Are you familiar with ATP, Greg? I've heard of it. Yeah. So if you open up literally any book that will make any mention of biology, you will read early in the book that ATP is the energy currency of the body, right? Or the energy currency of the cell. So when we talk about energy in a physiological context, a lot of times we talk about, you know, especially in the nutrition world, we talk about carb and fat and protein and calories and things like that. And that's all good. But ultimately, in order to do stuff in the body that requires energy, we got to break that stuff down into ATP. And that basically is a huge, uh, a huge portion of what we call metabolism. It's just figuring out how do we get from these ingested calories down to ATP to do a bunch of stuff in the body. Um, now, ATP does a lot of things. You know, it's like I said, it's the currency. It's it's the thing that's being exchanged when you're talking about processes that require energy. Um, but ATP is very critical for muscle contractions, and this is why it gets so much attention uh, in the fitness world. So when muscles are contracting, there are a lot of processes that obviously require energy. We need to be pumping calcium all over the place. We need to be pumping sodium and potassium. Uh, we need to be helping the myosin head release itself from actin. Uh, and so ATP is involved in all of these energetic processes of muscle contraction. So the concept, which sounds very nice on paper, is it'd be really great if we could provide some extra ATP for our body via direct oral supplementation. You know, if, if exercise requires so much ATP and it's so important for muscle contraction, then when we're lifting weights, it seems like it'd be really nice to have some extra ATP around. So this is something that has been studied um, you know, over the last 15 or 20 years or so uh, on a number of occasions. And so what I want to do in this segment is talk about kind of the historical context of ATP supplements and, you know, ATP boosting supplements and and then kind of tie that into a recent study that came out uh, just this year. Uh, so back in 2004, there was a study by Jordan and colleagues uh, and they were looking at ATP supplementation. They dosed it at 150 milligrams, and also they dosed it at 225 milligrams to see if one or the other or both might be uh, more favorable than a placebo. Uh, they basically found no significant benefits when they were comparing these different uh, these different groups. So they had nine subjects per group. Um, there were some little within group changes. So like, oh, from before to after supplementation in this group, we saw a significant increase. But at the end of the day, in a placebo controlled, randomized controlled trial like this, what you're trying to identify is relative to placebo, did these different doses of the supplement significantly outperform mm -hmm. that placebo treatment? Yeah. So in this case, um, you know, there were enough of those little within group differences to get people interested. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, a rigorous kind of by the book interpretation of the stats would indicate that there was no significant benefit beyond that of a placebo. And even within some of those little within group changes, you have to be really careful just based on some of the details of the methods. I, I think they did a really nice job with the study, so I, I don't want to sound overly critical, but, um, you know, there were some very obvious outliers. They did a really nice job reporting some of those individual level changes. So like, in one case, I'm, I'm pretty sure single dose supplementation for one person added like over 28 kilograms to their chest press. Um, and that was really just, I would, I would speculate, has something to do with the fact that the chest press increments were not very small. So it was like you'd, you could move up one plate or two or three plates. It was like a machine based kind of deal. Mm -hmm. That, of course, wouldn't alone explain it. But also just sometimes you come in, you have a crappy day. Or sometimes you're just really unfamiliar with chest pressing. And after a few sessions, it goes up by a tremendous amount, right? Yeah. But rest assured, no one is taking an ATP supplement and saying, you know what? I feel 30 kilograms stronger on my bench right now. Like, yeah. That's not going to happen. So this was a study, you know, it, it served its purpose as kind of the first study that I'm aware of in this area that kind of set the stage for future studies to kind of build upon. Um, but... Herda and colleagues came in uh, 2008 
with a purported ATP boosting supplement. And once again, um, supplementation did not lead to any really exciting differences between groups. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention in the Jordan study from 2004, probably one of the most important things from that study. Good thing I glossed over it. Yeah, I, I was wondering if uh, <laughs> if there was going to be some sort of like big twist reveal at the end. No, let, let's yeah. get let's get all the cards on the table. So the supplement in the Jordan study, whether it was given at 150 milligrams of ATP or 225, it did not increase blood ATP levels. Um, and it was really great that they checked in that study. But obviously, that's something that really sets the stage for major limitations in future research where you're like, well, if an ATP supplement is not increasing circulating ATP levels, at least based on, you know, plasma or, or serum measurements, what might be going on here if, yeah. if a supplement did work, yeah. right? So Jordan in 2004, no real significant benefits. Herda in 2008, no real significant benefits. Um, and then there was a study by Lowry and colleagues, actually a, a series of studies by Lowry and colleagues, all coming out of Jacob Wilson's lab down at uh, the University of Tampa. This was a series of studies where they looked at different combinations of ATP and HMB supplementation, sometimes both of them together. Um, and this series of studies, I'm just kind of going to hit the highlights of it. Like, I'm not going to go in, in, into really deep depth about the various methodological details because this series of studies uh, received very considerable interest from the scientific community. Um, you know, it, it received at least one letter to the editor, this group of studies um, that raised some questions uh, about the results and, and things that appeared to be inconsistencies from study to study. Um, and one of the things that really got a lot of attention um, and, and various blog posts and articles covered this the reported effects from different combinations of ATP and HMB were very comparable in magnitude to just straight up using steroids. Because um, there are studies on using steroids and lifting weights, uh, controlled studies. And so um, there was a lot of back and forth about that. At face, you know, on the surface, it seemed quite implausible that ATP and HMB would have this kind of effect because. Both had been studied previously and had never done that type of thing. And then you dig deeper and it seems even more implausible. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I, know, I remember one of the things that came up, I saw a lot of people say, well, no, it's just that there was this really hard training program and that's why it did this thing. But like the placebo group also did the training program yeah. and had very, you know, fairly typical placebo group type gains. And so that would kind of necessarily imply that like, the training details don't even really matter unless you're throwing the good stuff in there with yeah. the HMB and the ATP. Like, so yeah, there was just a lot of stuff that came up that seemed relatively implausible. A lot of scientists, um, you know, kind of echoed that, that, um, skepticism about these studies. There were letters to the editor. And, and so that's kind of, uh, where I leave it with that particular series of studies. But, uh, there's been another kind of wave of ATP, studies coming out. So uh, DeFridis and colleagues in 2019, uh, they had subjects taking oral ATP supplements at a dose of 400 milligrams, and uh, they ended up completing significantly greater volume load across four sets of half squats. And this was, you know, in comparison to a placebo treatment. So in that study, it looked like, okay, for some reason, uh, and again, the mechanisms really aren't very clear, it appeared that ATP given at 400 milligrams was helping people complete greater volume load in their training. So maybe this would be a nice training aid that helps you complete more volume per session, per training block, and, and potentially would uh, facilitate better longitudinal adaptations to training. And that is a leap going from acute effects on training volume to longitudinal effects on training adaptations, but that would be the thought process there. So Helms actually reviewed that study in mass, and he did a really nice job summarizing all of this ATP literature up to that point. And Helms, you know, came into it with an open mind and basically concluded based on the evidence, you know, maybe ATP supplementation could possibly enhance performance. But if it did, it appeared at that point specifically 
that it would help in circumstances where you're doing you know, multiple sets taken to failure or multiple sets with short rest periods. It's about kind of attenuating some of that fatigue in higher volume sessions where fatigue is really ramping up between sets. Uh, however, that, that was his kind of, um, you know, that, that was his like, maybe there could be something in these scenarios, but he also uh, concluded that based on the inconsistent findings in the literature uh, and the uncertainty related to the actual mechanism by which ATP supplementation would work, uh, he advised readers to hold off on ATP supplementation until more conclusive research became available. So um, he's like, maybe it could kind of work in some of these scenarios, but we don't know why. And the research seems to be really inconsistent. So probably not a safe bet with ATP supplements. Uh, now, there was a new study by Dos Santos, Nunez, De Mora, and colleagues in 2021. I actually reviewed it as a research brief uh, in the mass research review that went up today, February 1st. Nice. So this study had 20 recreationally trained male participants. It was a crossover design, so each participant completed all four of the study conditions. And the, the conditions were either a placebo, 100 milligrams of ATP, 200 milligrams of ATP, or 400 milligrams of ATP. And in all cases, they were ingested 30 minutes prior to uh, exercise testing. So they were doing four sets of barbell half squats, uh, squatting to about 90 degree knee angle. And they were using a load of 80% of one rep max, two, rep, uh, two minutes of rest between sets. So in terms of the findings, uh, the 400 milligram ATP dose uh, appeared to significantly increase the number of reps completed in set one, okay? But um, this was not, there, there were no significant effects with the lower doses. Uh, and also none of the ATP doses led to significantly greater uh, total reps or total volume when you look across all four sets. So what's really important about that is that, you know, Dr. Helms, the good doctor, Eric Helms, tentatively said, okay, maybe ATP could do something, but based on the literature, it should have its biggest impact potentially if you're doing multiple set performance theoretically to failure. It should be in the later sets mm -hmm. when it's uh, attenuating this fatigue that we really see ATP shining as a supplement. In this case, it only appeared to matter in the first set, which kind of goes against that, um, that rationale. And also, I, I think you would have to question the utility of a supplement you know, if you were to take a supplement and you're doing a, you know, 16 set workout and it's like, this will help you do more reps on set number one, <laughs> but, but not two through 16 and not total, you know, it's not going to favorably impact your total training volume in the session. I would very strongly question the utility of that type of supplement if that's representative of the true effects. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so yet again, we find ourselves in a situation with ATP supplementation where when we look at the applied research and we say, okay, what is a dose that should work? And in what circumstances should it do some predictable thing related to physiology? We still have uh, a lot of ambiguity and a lot of inconsistency. So every time a study like this comes out, uh, some people who are more uh, supplement friendly are very quick to pick it up and say, hey, Looks like ATP actually works now. Let's go ahead and supplement with it. I'm still quite skeptical um, for two main reasons. First, of course, is the inconsistency related to the applied findings. But the second one that we really can't overlook is that I really struggled to identify a mechanism that seems both plausible and optimally targeted by ATP supplementation. Mm -hmm. So the, the two most common mechanisms you'll see there the first one is just very generally increasing ATP availability during exercise. Like, hey, exercise requires ATP. Here's some more ATP. The second mechanism you hear about a lot is potentially ATP supplements increasing blood flow via vasodilation. So the idea is that red blood cells kind of take up this ATP, and that's why we're not seeing it increase in like plasma mm -hmm. after oral supplementation. And then during exercise, those red blood cells are, are kind of letting go of that ATP and, and helping promote vasodilation during exercise. 
So the first issue is with the ATP availability one. So like I was reading through a textbook and this is really, these numbers are really baffling, but based on the, the textbook I was reading, I didn't bother to go in and recalculate stuff. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> the human body based on the textbook uses 40 kilograms of ATP per day at rest. That's crazy. I did, I did not realize it was that much. Yeah. So again, I didn't bother to go through and recalculate, but somebody let this into a textbook and I don't know, seems fine for me, but 40 kilograms of ATP per day at rest. And during intense exercise, uh, the textbook indicated that ATP utilization can reach up to 0.5 kilograms per minute when you're doing like really intense continuous exercise. Mm -hmm. So if we take those numbers at face value and assume that they're even within the ballpark of being close to true. The idea that you're going to introduce 400 more milligrams, yeah. so like 0 0.4 grams of ATP into exercise and actually do anything with it, you know, anything beyond just a drop in a bucket, it's just really implausible to think. Yeah, just to make the uh just to make the math easier, if we say it's 500 milligrams. Yeah. That would be enough to cover one one thousandth of your ATP needs per minute during intense <laughs> exercise. Right. And, and which, so which doesn't seem like much. Yeah. And, and so if you're hearing that, you're saying, well, OK, but that's for 400 or 500 milligrams. Let's really ramp it up. The, the human the dose lift the most, baby. Exactly. Yeah. So the human body can only store about 80 to 100 grams of ATP at a time. That's one of the reasons that it's so important for us to be continuously generating it is because we can't just have like a 40 kilogram flap where we keep all of our ATP that we're going to need for the day. So, um, yeah, so like we need to constantly be creating it. Throwing 400 milligrams into the sea of ATP, it, it's a drop in the bucket. It, it's really not going to matter. So then the other um, the other issue is through the whole uh, idea that the red blood cells are taking it up and, and eventually they're helping to promote blood flow via vasodilation and things like that. Um, so during exercise, red blood cells do release a little bit of ATP. This is part of what promotes localized vasodilation. There's really a lot of stuff going on during exercise that manages vasodilation and vasoconstriction during exercise, especially locally. There are many, many things happening to make sure that the muscle is getting sufficient blood flow to do the exercise it needs to do. Also, a lot of control going on to make sure that blood is circulating appropriately so that we don't have insane fluctuations in blood pressure and, and, and you know, uh, cardiac output and things like that. So this is a finely tuned response. Um, now, there are conditions where you might see that... Uh, ATP release from red blood cells is reduced. And so this could potentially attenuate vasodilation during conditions of exercise or conditions of hypoxia. So it is possible that attenuating ATP release from red blood cells could be problematic in maximally facilitating this vasodilation. However, this is generally seen in older sedentary people in experimental conditions. So we don't usually see this kind of impaired ATP release from red blood cells in young, healthy people. We also see that this impairment that kind of occurs with age is attenuated very considerably in older athletes. So the idea that we're seeing these huge effects of ATP supplementation in young, healthy, active people, I think it's relatively implausible based on this particular mechanism and everything that comes with it. So. I'm just not there yet with ATP supplements. I don't think the applied research is consistent enough for me personally. Um, I don't think the mechanisms are very clearly elucidated. We know that plasma kind of circulating ATP is not increasing to a noticeable degree mm -hmm. when, when it's provided as a supplement. Uh, perhaps red blood cells are taking it up for, for later use, but I'm just not seeing a clear mechanism that would explain uh, some of the applied findings that have been observed. Doesn't mean that ATP could not possibly do anything. It's just the research really isn't there yet to give you a really strong basis for what it's doing and how it's doing it. 
So one of my things that I want to focus on moving forward is not just uh, shooting down ideas, but also trying to make sure I'm giving good alternatives and being maximally helpful. So let's say that you found some of those mechanisms to be interesting. ATP availability and vasodilation. One of the reasons that I really see ATP supplementation as a non-starter is because we already have really good supplements for both of those things. So if you're really interested in maximizing ATP availability during exercise, I can think of no greater supplement than creatine monohydrate. Oh, I thought you were going to say EPO. Uh, well, <laughs> supplement, <laughs> uh, supplement. So, uh, Creatine monohydrate, like, you know, we, we talked about the amount of ATP that you need relative to the dose provided. It just doesn't make any sense. Physiologically, mm -hmm. it's, it's a drop in the bucket. When we supplement with creatine monohydrate, we can increase our total creatine concentration in muscle by, you know, up to 15 to 30 percent if we're a responder to creatine. And we can increase phosphocreatine resynthesis by up to 20 to 50 percent. These are real big physiologically relevant changes in the phosphagen energy system that provides ATP during intense exercise. So if you're really intrigued and thinking, oh, I'd like to use a supplement that increases ATP availability during exercise, go with creatine. It's tried and true. There's a million studies on it. If you want more vasodilation, this is something we've talked about a million times before, uh, four to six grams of citrulline and or 400 to 800 milligrams of dietary nitrate. It's an extremely straightforward mechanism by which these supplements would facilitate vasodilation if there's any impairment of vasodilation occurring. So you look at some of the studies in younger, healthy individuals, and sometimes you don't see a big effect on vasodilation with these supplements. Um, it, in some cases, it still improves performance without meaningfully affecting vasodilation through other mechanisms. But when you look in situations where vasodilation might be impaired, particularly studies with older individuals who are sedentary, these supplements do a really nice job with, with promoting vasodilation. So it's not just that the ATP research is inconsistent. It's that it looks like it's filling a potential role here that is already taken care of by supplements with much more research supporting them. So mm -hmm. Uh, for those reasons, I'm still very skeptical of ATP supplements, and that's not to disparage any of the individuals doing research in this area. I'm just really skeptical by nature. So I, I need a lot of evidence to convince me to open up my wallet or to convince me to recommend a supplement. I haven't seen it yet with ATP, and it's going to take not just you know one more study showing a few more bench press reps. I need someone to really show me how it's working and somehow convince me to believe that it's doing these things better than the supplements that are already available. You know, mm -hmm. so for me to go with ATP over creatine and a more established vasodilator, I'm just not even close. Yeah. And, and just to spell things out more with the, with the creatine comparison, one of the reasons that creatine would be a preferable supplement to something like ATP, even if ATP worked, is you know, let's say you take some ATP, it increases muscle concentration of ATP uh, one time, you do a set, you kind of deplete that, and then you're just back on the, the normal ATP resynthesis treadmill. Um, whereas with creatine, what, what creatine itself does is like it's, it's a little thing that phos phosphates can latch on to, and then as you deplete ATP during exercise, it's a lot quicker to just kind of take a phosphate from creatine phosphate and move it over to an ADP to make it an ATP again. Uh, so that, that's a very quick and efficient little, little swap you can do. And then that creatine is still hanging out in the muscle. So, uh, you know, you finish a set, you rest, take some time, breathe, kind of get back towards energetic baseline. And you can attach more phosphates to that creatine that is still in your muscles. So basically with ATP, it would just be kind of a one-time use thing, whereas higher creatine concentrations in your muscles could improve performance, you know, every single set over time. Yeah, and that, that's a really good addition because it contextualizes one of the numbers that I shared. Some of the earliest studies on creatine were looking at, you know, in responders, how much are we actually facilitating that process, that mm -hmm that resynthesis of phosphocreatine where the creatine during rest periods is taking up all of those phosphates 
so that it can then very quickly, you know, contribute to more ATP production. And in responders, we're talking about a 20 to 50 percent increase in the rate of that phosphocreatine resynthesis. So it is a noteworthy, physiologically meaningful impact there. So with ATP supplementation, like I said, um, it's fascinating. I, I like the physiology behind it. I think ATP, if you like physiology, you have to think ATP is interesting because like that, like I said, there, that's what metabolism is. You're spending most of your time talking about ATP. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm just not really there yet with, with ATP supplements. And I think there are better options on the market. Uh, hopefully we'll learn more about ATP in the future, but uh, for now, I, I'd personally say skip it. Yeah, I mean, my uh, my slightly less charitable read of the literature. So I, actually, actually, I, I've got a question for you. Okay. The 2019 and 2021 studies on ATP supplementation, uh, do you remember right off the top of your head if they were industry funded or not? Uh, I know the 2021 paper was industry yeah. funded. I don't know the 2019 paper off the top of my head. So the like j just looking at those results, the first thing that comes to mind for me uh, is that I know that uh, one of one of the companies that sells an ATP supplement is pretty active in in funding research, and just looking at some of the differences, especially in that 2021 study that were there, like you know. You you have four sets. You only find a significant difference in one of them. Uh, the difference, like the raw difference, is one point two reps, and the p value is 0 0.04. And you know, there's four other opportunities to find significant differences. The other three sets, and then overall volume, and they didn't find that. You know, but they still found one significant difference. Paper gets published. To me, that smells a lot like the the tactic of just like industry funding studies and then just kind of picking and choosing which experiments they want to get published or not. Um, you know, so it, it makes me wonder if there are also a lot of recent null results that are just kind of sitting around unpublished somewhere. Um, and, and, and to be clear, like that's, that's not taking shots at the researchers themselves. Like that's a, that's a relatively, common uh, approach for for industry funding to take but yeah ju just looking at those results it, it it looks like what i would expect if that strategy were being employed by industry yeah i mean you know my, my thing is i i don't have i know you're not doing this but i i don't try to you know get into the intentions of what might be going on behind the scenes or anything like that um i'm just you know looking at the data i, I i'm i would assume that there are probably some acute studies on ATP supplementation that are just sitting in a, yeah. a file cabinet that, that didn't get published um, of the stuff that has been published. One of the reasons I don't I haven't dug too deeply into the behind the scenes kind of considerations is there's not even enough out here in the open to even say like, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, you should definitely be. T you know, if there well, were yeah, like, I, I mean, we might know 10 years down the line, a meta analysis gets published and. There's just the wonkiest looking funnel plot you've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, but but, but yeah, you know, there, there's for, not even enough now to to get an idea of that. Yeah, and also just not enough to um, not enough to make me so like for example, if there was a study that or a, a supplement that hit the market, and there's like nine studies, even six studies showing considerable meaningful benefits and it's consistent there's a, a mechanism identified uh you know the effects look the way you would expect if that mecha mechanism was working consistently you know if if that were the case but all the studies were coming from this one group with this one funding source who owns the supplement then you start to say wait a minute there's a lot of positive data out here but i'm getting a little uneasy about it in this case, there's not even really enough positive data to, to bother digging into the deep stuff, because if someone's saying like, hey, I really want to take it, I'm like, I, I don't really know why. Like, there, I, I just don't see enough positive data out in the open to even bother worrying about what's going on behind mm -hmm. the scenes, you know? Yeah, that's fair.